This morning's scripture reading will be coming from Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. If you'd like to follow along, Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as testimony to them. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will, and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go let it, go let it be done just as you believed it would and his servant was healed at that moment. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He, he touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with the word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what is spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. In this passage of scripture, we are certainly not looking at the very first time that Jesus healed anyone of their illnesses or of their diseases. Back in John chapter or Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24, Jesus had already been doing this prior to his great Sermon on the Mount when we read that news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all those who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. But immediately after chapter 4 we move into chapters 5, 6, and 7 where we have been studying Jesus' Sermon on the Mount for the last several months. And it is in this particular lesson that Jesus delivers that we do not simply see His healing power from a miraculous standpoint, but we see His healing power from the words that He spoke, the divine will of His Father. And so after that important lesson, after those great teachings that are embodied within that particular sermon, we move into chapter 8 where we this morning see four different healings, four different miraculous events that take place. And somebody might say, well, Kevin, couldn't you have dealt with each of those in a different lesson? And certainly that's the case. But I think that there is something that is important that relates these four together. And I think that they are included together, one right after the other, to establish some points. Points that demonstrate certainly the power of Jesus and His healing, but also a power that was not simply embodied in the miraculous, but in who He was and the significance or the importance of the words He had just spoken. So what I want to remind you of as we jump into this lesson are those words that were spoken, those words that were concluded at the end of chapter 7, where the people marveled at what Jesus had just said, not what He had done, but what He had just said. 
they marveled at him. And as we read in chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for his teach, he was teaching them as one having authority and not their scribes. So follow along with me starting in chapter 8 and verse 1. And we're going to take a look at the first of these four miraculous healings that demonstrated Jesus' miraculous power. And we're going to take a look at the first four verses as we examine this story of the leper who came to Jesus. We see that he's coming off of the mountainside where he has just preached that sermon. And in verse 2, a leper came to him and bowed down before him. Now, if you have the King James Version or the New King James Version, you will see that it reads that he came and worshipped him. Now, when we come together to assemble as a body of believers like we have done this morning and we worship God, we are acknowledging Him as deity. We are giving Him gifts, which is what our worship is, as we are giving Him the, the fruit of our lips. We are offering up to Him our prayers. We even offer a, 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 of the things that we have been prospered in this life as we give back to Him a portion of what He has already given us. When we remember the Lord's Supper and we remember the body and the blood of His Son who died on the cross, these are things that we offer to Him. When the leper came to Jesus, and as the King James and New King James says, worship, the word worship here does not mean probably what we think it means. Going back to the original word, it was really something that simply bestowed honor upon someone else. And so what we see here is, the leper may or may not have understood who Jesus was. The leper may or may not have understood that he was God in the flesh. But he did recognize that Jesus was someone different. He did recognize that he was someone significant, that he was someone unique. And he recognized Jesus as someone who had the power to heal. Now maybe he had heard about what had been going on in chapter 4 with Jesus' healings. Maybe he was on the outskirts of that big crowd and he was able to hear some of those amazing words of Jesus during that sermon. But whatever the case, he comes down and bows before Jesus, acknowledging him as someone who was worthy of the leper's submission, that Jesus himself was worthy of this honor. And he says to the Lord, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I want you to think about that statement. There are three things in that statement that I just want you to very quickly understand. First of all, he's asking permission. He's not telling Jesus what to do. He's not demanding anything. He's simply asking him, are you willing? He also sees, in, or we see in that statement, that he is an unclean individual. A person who had leprosy under the law of Moses was declared an unclean individual by the priest. In fact, if you want to learn more about lepers in the Old Testament and how they would have to go before the priest to be declared unclean, and then if for some reason they were made clean, how they would go back. You need to read Leviticus 13 and Leviticus 14, and they're long chapters, and they include a lot of the rules for God's people under the law of Moses concerning leprosy. But then we also see the fact that he's asking Jesus to make him clean. That means he's asking Jesus to heal him of something that in that day and in that time was virtually incurable. So a dreaded disease that was contagious, that was even hereditary in some cases, visiting someone down to the, to the third and the fourth generation. It was a terrible condition. Not only was it a terrible condition physically that could eventually rob a person of his life, but it was a terrible condition socially as no one wanted to get near you, as you were quite literally expected to walk on the other side of the street, to stay away from people, to even have your own communities with other lepers in colonies away from the masses. It was a terrible condition indeed. And yet this man comes to Jesus and is not only asking to be cleansed, but he has the confidence that Jesus can when he says, you can make me clean. 
Jesus stretched out his hand, verse 3, and touched him. Something that was absolutely taboo at that time. He touched this unclean individual. And he said, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. In verse 4 we see that Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. I want to start with the last part of that verse first because he was under the law of Moses as a Jewish man, this leper, compelled to go to the priest and to show himself and to give an offering as was commanded. Leviticus chapter 14 and verse 4 demonstrates that this man who is now cured of his leprosy was to go to the priest and to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop and that would be given to the priest as an offering. So Jesus, even though he is God in the flesh, he says, we still live under a law. We are still Jewish men. We still have an obligation to obey the will of God as it has been given to us at this point in time. And so nowhere and in no way does Jesus ever suggest that people violate or go against the law under which they were living. But one of the things that we see also here is what Jesus says when he says, go tell no one. You would think that if this man would go out and tell people that he was cleansed, and certainly there's a certain part of this that's going to be obvious to the people around him anyway. But if he would go out and spread the message of Jesus Christ, that he would be doing much like what we are compelled to do. And yet this situation is a little bit different. It is still very early in the ministry of Jesus. And the more he preaches powerful words the more he demonstrates the power of the Holy Spirit in these healings and in these miracles that he's performing, the more people are going to want to come to him, the more people are going to require of him, and perhaps he understood that might hinder the job that he had to do, a job that he understood he would only have perhaps three to three and a half years at best to accomplish before his life would be taken from him. But Jesus obeyed the law and Jesus cleansed the leper. In verses 5 through 13, we see the second miracle that Jesus performs, the second healing. And this is in regard to a centurion's son. Now a centurion, if you think of that word, it's much like our word century. A century is a hundred years. And a centurion was a Roman guard who was over a hundred men. And so we read in verse 5 that when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him imploring him or begging him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. I want you to consider that for just a moment because we don't know to what extent was this paralysis. A lot of times when we think of a person who is paralyzed, we might think of someone from the neck down or from the waist down down. And in either of those situations we would think, well, why is that person tormented? They can't feel anything. Well, just because a person cannot feel something physically does not mean that they are not mentally or emotionally not feeling in this area. In fact, it might be a very terrible thing. You can imagine that if you could walk, that if you could move, to lose that ability suddenly would be a very traumatic thing to you far less traumatic than this particular situation is a situation that I'm dealing with concerning the accident that I was in two and a half months ago. I have two fingers on my right hand, my middle finger that virtually doesn't feel anything and my index finger that feels about half of what it should. Now those are very small things in comparison to what we're talking about and yet it's a concern to me. It bothers me. In fact, because I can't feel certain things, I have to be actually more careful about these two fingers that I don't rake it across something sharp or, or get near something that could puncture it because I might not feel it until the damage is done. So even in this very small situation, it bothers me. 
But what about a person who is paralyzed partially, or perhaps as some commentaries have suggested, this is a person who might have been unable to move in some way because of seizures, because of cramps, things that would cause him great physical pain. Whatever the case, the centurion says his servant is fearfully tormented. What's interesting is he does not ask Jesus to come to him. He does not even say what the leper says, are you willing? But Jesus immediately in verse 7 said to him, I will come and heal him. Jesus demonstrates already that he is willing. He has a great task to perform. He has a great message to get out. But he loves us. And he loved this centurion. And he loved his servant. And he did not want to see anyone suffer. He said, I am willing. I will come and heal him. Verse 8 begins with our friend, the conjunction, but. Because it's interesting that if Jesus says to you, yes, I will come and heal your servant, you wouldn't want to start off the next word with but. You might start off the next sentence with thank God, thank you. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this. But verse 8 says, but. The centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. The leper actually goes to Jesus. The leper actually puts himself in Jesus' presence. And the leper shows humility and submission to Jesus. When he falls down before him, he bows down and acknowledges that he is someone great. The centurion goes one step further. The centurion actually says, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. He says, I'm barely worthy to be in your presence here, but I certainly don't want you to come all the way to my house. You are too important, and I am too insignificant. And furthermore, you don't have to be in the presence of my servant. You don't have to be in my home. You don't even have to come in physical contact with him in order to cleanse him. All you have to do is say the word. Why does the centurion say that? Well, he explains himself in verse 9. He says, I also am a man under authority. Please notice that word. With soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Someone said to me just recently, when we were discussing a particular Bible teaching, and perhaps why some people have a hard time accepting what this particular Bible teaching declares, this person said to me, perhaps it's because they don't understand authority. Perhaps it's because they don't respect authority. And I think that this is a growing problem in our world. It's certainly a growing problem in our nation. We see it as a growing problem in our homes because authority was originally established in the home. It was taught in the home. Kids were taught to obey and respect their parents. Why? Because they were their parents. And they understood that if they went to school and didn't respect their teacher, they were not only going to get in trouble with the authority at school, but then they were going to get in twice as much trouble with the authority at home when they came back home. And they were raised to understand that there were people over us. They were raised to understand that there are people in charge of us, people who have authority over us, and we're to respect them. And the centurion establishes by using himself as a small reference that the authority of Jesus, the authority that he's had to perform miracles in the past, the authority of the words that he spoke in that great sermon, the centurion says, your authority is so great and so high and so mighty that all you have to do is speak the word and he'll be healed. Remember that the centurion was probably not a Jew. In fact, we have that belief based upon what Jesus says next. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, 
probably a large company of Jews who were following, he said, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. In other words, he's saying of all the Jewish people, I've not seen such great faith, such understanding of authority as this man who's a Gentile. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, and remember that Jesus himself, who was a son of Israel, as he speaks to the children of Israel, the people who belonged to the kingdom of God at that time, people who were God's chosen people under the law of Moses. He says the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place that is similarly referred to in Matthew 22 and verse 13 where virtually the same terminology is used. Throw him into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a description of that eternal place of judgment for the unrighteous, for the people who will not listen to Jesus, for the people who will not accept what He is teaching, and the people who will not obey Him by following in His footsteps. Jesus marvels at this man because He understands authority. As brother Paul Barnum and I were visiting just the other day, we were talking about the plan of salvation. We were talking about just exactly what does the Bible say in regard to what a person needs to do to be saved, to become a child of God, to be a member of the body of Christ. And we were talking about Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. And where we read in that passage of Scripture, part of the Great Commission, where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we were talking about what that phrase, in the name of, means. If you've ever watched a, a television show or a movie where a policeman is chasing a criminal, I'm hoping that none of you have actually experienced this process personally, but where a policeman is chasing a criminal and he pulls out his gun and he says, Stop in the name of the law. Well, what's he saying? He's saying, Stop by the authority of the government and the laws that it has established to uphold the peace of its citizenship. Stop. He's saying, I have the authority to command you to stop. And when we read that people are to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what we're saying here is we are to be baptized by the authority of God, by the permission that He gives us through His love and His grace to grant us the ability to be saved by coming in contact with the cleansing blood of Jesus that can wash away our sins. Jesus says of the centurion, I've not seen such great faith in all of Israel. And in verse 13, he said, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 and 15, we see the third healing that takes place in this passage of Scripture. And it's concerning Peter and his mother-in-law. And yes, Peter had a mother-in-law because Peter was married. It's hard to have a mother-in-law, i found, if you're not married. And so, yes, by virtue of the fact that despite what many people in the religious world believe that Peter was never married. He had a mother-in-law. He was married. In fact, we were reading just recently in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5 when Paul asked the question, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife as, and he compares it to Cephas or Peter. So yes, Peter had a wife. And yes, Peter had a mother-in-law. And in verse 14, when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. Now thus far, we've talked about leprosy, a terrible, incurable disease at that point in time. We've talked about paralysis of some nature, something that we've said even the smallest of bit can be concerning to the person that it victimizes. But can you imagine the person who is the quadriplegic or the paraplegic? 
the, the person who perhaps cannot move his body at all. What a terrible situation that is. And we move to Peter's mother-in-law and all she has is a temperature. We actually kind of know what to do with that. We like the pill that makes the temperature go like that, go away like that, but, but we understand. Go to bed, drink plenty of liquids, uh, eat some chicken noodle soup. And eventually that fever will usually come down. But here she is suffering from something that we understand that even if we take care of it properly, it goes away eventually, not at that moment. And what we read in verse 15 is that he touched her hand and the fever left her. Evidently left her so well that we read that she got up and waited on him. She did what a lot of the women at that time would do. She served the guest in her home. She was well enough to do just that. Now, although a fever is a small thing, and we've talked about leprosy and paralysis, much bigger things, at least, at least as we judge it, we leave the fourth healing, the fourth miracle in this passage of Scripture for something that is perhaps on the other end from the fever, on the other end from this temperature. And we suddenly look at, in verses 16 and 17, a man who is possessed of a demon. He is not dealing with a physical problem or an emotional problem or a mental problem. He's dealing with a spiritual problem, something of the spiritual realm in that a demon, uh, an angel of Satan or some other type of evil spiritual entity has possessed his body, has taken control of what he says and what he does. And you can imagine how terrible that would be. And we read in verse 16, When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. You can imagine as they bring in not one but multiple people who are possessed of these evil spirits. Jesus had the power to do that. Jesus had the power to cast them out. And once again, if you watch television or you watch movies and you see Hollywood's depiction of someone who is possessed of an evil spirit, you'll always have some religious fellow walk in and he'll bring in crosses and crucifixes and he'll bring in uh, different little things that he's been told that if he uses it will help cast out a demon and he'll chant and he'll say things over and over and over again to try to basically coax that spirit out of the person. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We read here that everyone who was brought to Jesus in this condition was healed. Everyone who faced the healing power of Jesus received it. There was no exception to that rule. And there was no limit to their healing. It was done entirely. And it was done completely. And verse 17 says this, not only this particular instance, but I would argue all four of these healings, but this particular instance certainly was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Now this is a reference to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, a, a future prophecy of the coming of Christ and the power that He would wield to help those who were in need. When we think about miracles in the Bible, and for those of you who have studied this subject, talking about the miracles that existed then versus why those miracles do not continue to exist today, why God chose to end it at a particular point in time. What we find are about four reasons in the Bible why miracles existed. The first of those four reasons really doesn't have anything to do with our lesson this morning, but I'll mention it to you. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, and it was basically proof that an, a, an apostle who claimed that he was an apostle was a true apostle. If he's an apostle of the Lord, handpicked by Christ himself, then he would be able to perform the supernatural, the miraculous. But I want you to take a look at other passages of Scripture. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17, the passage of Scripture we just read, gives us a second reason 
why the miraculous existed, and that was to fulfill prophecy. By Jesus performing these miracles, by Jesus supernaturally healing these people of their sicknesses, of their illnesses, He was proving or was fulfilling what was prophesied in the Old, which not only establishes the truth of the Old Testament, but it helps to establish the truth of the New Testament as well. In John chapter 20, John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31, we read that there are many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of His disciples, a sign being a type of miracle, something that was supernatural. There are many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. One of the second reasons for miracles in the Bible was to establish that Jesus was God, that Jesus was the Son of God, that He was deity incarnate or God in the flesh. So this was to prove that Jesus was God. And in Mark 16 and verse 20, we see a fourth and final reason why miracles existed in Scripture, and that was to confirm the Word of God, the Word that was spoken at that time. And they went out and preached everywhere, we read, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the Word by the signs that followed. Now, again, of those four reasons for miracles, the first one really doesn't have to do with our text this morning. But the last three do. Not only do we see Jesus by performing these great healings, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, but we see Him proving that He is God in the flesh. And then we see the confirmation of the word that is spoken. What word? Well, remember chapters 5, 6, and 7. That great sermon that He just got through preaching. There may have been some people who had seen His miracles and came to hear Him preach. But there may have been many more perhaps that came to hear Him preach that hung around to witness some of these miracles. And not only were they amazed at what they said, but when Jesus started performing these great feats, when He cleanses a leper, heals someone who's paralyzed, takes a woman's fever away, even has the power to cast out devils that have possessed a body. They see that as confirmation that this man is special, that he is unique, that he's got a power we've not witnessed before. He must be who he claims to be. He must be the Messiah. Now I want to say one more thing, make one more point before we bring this lesson to a conclusion. And it's found there in the body of your text, so don't close your Bibles. Because I want to point out something else that I had a real hard time not pointing out as I went through it. Because every time I read these things, I pick up on these words that demonstrate something that makes Jesus not only different from the scribes of the people in the first century, but it makes him different from the false teachers and the false preachers and these fake faith healers that we see on TV today. These people that go up to somebody in a wheelchair and if the person in the wheelchair isn't a part of the act, they have two or three people help them stand up and then they let go of them for two or three seconds and hoping that the person doesn't fall, everybody shouts hallelujah, but in order to get the person off the stage, they've got to put them back in the wheelchair and roll them off. To somebody who has a, uh, an illness or a problem that we can't see, uh, maybe they, they have a difficulty hearing, well, we can't see that. Maybe they've got a digestive problem, we can't see that. Maybe they've got a problem with headaches, we can't see that. But the solution is to slap them on the head, make them fall down and shout, be healed, and everybody else shouts, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. If somebody walks up to you with leprosy in the first century by the visible signs on their body from head to toe, you knew they had leprosy. When somebody is paralyzed and cannot move and you see their body starting to shrink and their muscles starting to atrophy, you know that that's real. 
even when somebody has something as small as a fever, you can do what your mama did and hold their forehead and figure it out if you don't have a thermometer. And you can only imagine how scary it was to see someone who was actually possessed by an evil spirit. But unlike those charlatans that were present in Jesus' day and are certainly present in our day, here's the difference. Here's what made Jesus stand out. Look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 3. What happened when Jesus healed the leper? It says, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Look at chapter 8 and verse 13. What happens to the centurion servant who was paralyzed? We read that the servant was healed that very moment. Look at verse 15. Peter's mother-in-law who has a fever. Jesus touches her and the fever left her. So much so that the next statement says, and she got up. Obviously she was lying down, perhaps in bed. She got up and was immediately well enough to wait on those who were present. And verse 16, when people were brought to Jesus with evil spirits possessing their bodies, He spoke not a ritual, not a whole bunch of things that He quoted over and over and over again, hoping that there would be an effect. It says, He spoke a word. And they left. You didn't have to have somebody chanting, the power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. And you do that all day and all night. And when it hasn't worked for you, you have somebody else come in and chant it behind you uh, and after you and continue to do it until hopefully it works. He spoke a word. And the evil spirits left. Nothing like that exists today. Nothing like that exists on TV or in tent shows or things like that. And I would dare say that even with the power given to the disciples that sometimes didn't find success even when they were trying to do it, nothing existed like the power of our Lord to heal back then either. It was unique to him because he had the power not in limitation but without measure. What does this have to do with us today? When it comes to our sins today, we have access to that same healing power. Not talking about if we have a cut or a a couple of fingers that don't work real well, or even a fever. No, no, no. We're talking about an illness. We're talking about a disease. We're talking about a sickness that is far worse than anything that can infect us in this physical world. We're talking about sin. We're talking about a spiritual illness that will not only rob us of joy and peace in this life, but it will rob us of an eternity in heaven with God one day. And yet Jesus loves us. Jesus cares about us. Just like in passages of Scripture like Matthew 14, 14 and Matthew 20 and verse 34, the reason that Jesus healed people was because He looked at them, He saw them in their condition, and He had compassion on us. Well, the Bible says that God in heaven above looked down on His creation and saw us lost in our sin. And He looked down upon us with love in His heart. And He looked down upon us with compassion. And we read that God so loved the world that He gave to this world His only begotten Son, His one and only child, so that those of us who would believe in Him, for the, so that those of us who would accept His teaching, so that those of us who would live according to His commandments would not perish but have eternal life. So the question this morning is not for those of you who have headaches or arthritis, or back pain, or whatever. The question is for those of you who are outside of the body of Christ, for those of you who understand that you have sin in your life and you're wanting to know how to get healed, 
the power of our Lord awaits you. The blood that He shed on the cross awaits you coming in contact with it so that it can cleanse you and make you whole. Just put your faith into practice. With godly sorrow, repent of your sins. Confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart. And in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be baptized by immersion in water for the forgiveness or the cleansing of your sin so that you can rise to walk up born again, a child of God, a new creation. And if you are a child of God who's come in contact with the blood of Jesus, I hope that you are walking in the light as He is in the light as 1 John 1, 7 teaches us so that the blood of Jesus can continue to cleanse you as you walk through this life of sin and you can look forward to that home in heaven. But if you've gotten off track, if you are allowing something in the world to hold you back from giving God your best and your all, if you've gone back into the world and its ways, Take the opportunity right now as a child of the Father to go to Him in prayer with a penitent heart and ask for forgiveness so that you can be clean, so that you can be whole, so that you can be healed. And if we can help you to do that through prayer or encouragement, if there's anything that we can do for you this morning, let's all come in contact with the healing power of Jesus while together we stand and sing.